What is it that makes the British seaside sinister? Why does it seem to attract so many killers? Is it the fact that the tide washes away their sins? Is it the fact that it's the end of the line? There's nothing overly frightening about a big wheel or a carousel. But what is undeniable is that the British seaside attracts and has always attracted death and murder. Hello, I'm Geoffrey Wansell. I write about crime, true crime. And in this new series, I want you to join me on a journey to the cliff's edge, where land meets the sea and where life meets death. Whilst some may consider my opinions to be bold, they have been formed after writing bestsellers about killers for the past 30 years and staring evil in the face. For make no mistake, there is something sinister about our British seaside towns. On the surface, they're all fun fairs, candy floss and breezy promenades. But by digging a little deeper in the sand, we uncover an underworld of misfits and misfeasance, murder and mayhem. And reveal the dark lives of the most deadly coastal killers to ever stalk our shores. The Isle of Anglesey, off the coast of North Wales, has long been steeped in mystery and mysticism. Those generations of folklore, however, saw no mention of vampirism. All that changed in November 2001, when a killer terrorised the island, taking bloodlust to a whole new level. On the surface, Matthew Hardman was a perfectly ordinary, rather shy, young man who lived in a respectable family. He had two elder sisters. His parents apparently were happy, but sadly they divorced. Hardman remained closer to his father, the only male figure in his family life. And then, catastrophically, when he was 13, his father died of an asthma attack. Now, whether that was the trigger for what was to happen later, we will never know. But what is clear is in the secret privacy of his own bedroom, he developed a fascination with vampirism. Hardman, at the age of 17, was an art student studying in Anglesey. He wasn't particularly weird, he didn't wear black. He was, uh, in many ways, unremarkable. So what was it that made him decide to kill a 90-year-old woman, Mabel Latham, his neighbour? He delivered her papers. She knew who he was. And yet, for some unfathomable reason, Hardman decided to end her life, but not just to end it, to end it in the most brutal manner. And this particular murder terrified the island. When it happened, the populace were told, the devil has come to Anglesey. It was the most unexpected thing to have happened. This was not a place where evil struck. It was too ordinary, respectable, straightforward for something as dreadful as this crime. I took a telephone call from a colleague telling me that he wanted me to pick up a job in Clanvire PG on Anglesey. It was a Sunday afternoon, I remember, um, about two, three o'clock-ish, and so I made my way as quick as I could over to uh, um, the scene in Anglesey. 
there was a, an elderly lady now known to be Mabel Lation, age 90, living at a property by herself. And she'd been visited midday by Meals on Wheels on a Sunday lunchtime to take her hot food. Uh, not getting an answer at the front door, the uh, lady delivering the food had gone to the back and seen broken glass and a broken window in the door. Uh, became quite rightly concerned, called the police, and uh, there was an emergency response by the local um, uniformed police staff. Um, they entered the premises and then as a result of what they saw, uh, it was called in and a major crime investigation was commenced. When Hardman killed Mabel Lation, he chose to do it on a night in which his mother and her current partner had gone away. He was on his own in the house. He picked up a kitchen knife from his own house, walked less than 100 yards down to Mabel Lasham's beautiful little bungalow, little driveway, small garage, a gate. You couldn't imagine anything more upright, respectable, and at the same time, unremarkable. And yet what he did when he got inside the door after breaking the window was catastrophic. Can you imagine what it must have been like sitting in front of the television and out of the background, without any warning, a man arrives, a young man in this case, 17, stabs her. Not just once, not just twice, 22 times. He kills her outrageously. And then, it's not enough just to kill her. He then wants to pose the body and fulfill the vampire fantasy. It was quite a difficult scene to interpret at first. Uh, very, very bloodstained. Um, and there was um, a couple of candlesticks that had been um, put on the floor. Uh, some pokers taken from the fireplace which had been put in a cross uh, in front of a chair that she was sat at and the saucepan, uh, some newspaper in the saucepan. Um, all of this was examined and it took quite some time before the full version of events unfolded. So I was called to say that a body had been discovered in Hamby at Pot Gwyngith. It's a place that a lot of people will have heard of but may not actually related to uh, one of the most horrific murders that this country has ever seen. You walk in, you can see a sofa armchair where clearly Mabel Lation had been sitting. I think, if I remember, her glasses were on the uh, armrest and various magazines were open, including either a TV or a Radio Times. Uh, but she was in a different position. She was not in that chair, she was laid out in another armchair facing you as you walked in. It was clear that Mabel Lation had been laid out after death and that attempts had been made to open up her body in a number of areas with the um, idea of possibly draining blood from her because it became immediately obvious that a number of the larger wounds were post-mortem. And then there were a number of stab wounds and a number of defensive wounds. And by that I mean wounds to the arms and the hands, which you will see when a victim tries to ward off an attacker and protect themselves. They put their hands up, they will get injuries to the forearms and to the hands, particularly if they try and grab a knife blade coming at them. So as well as those, it was also obvious that there was a huge wound to the chest. Couldn't see it very well, but it was clear that the sternum had been split open down its full length and the cavity beneath, where you would normally expect to see the heart, looked empty and right by to the right of her feet, 
um, was a silver platter full of fresh blood and blood clot with a pan sitting in that and a newspaper wrapped object in the pan. Uh, and the suspicion was that could be a, her heart. He cuts her heart out. Can you imagine how difficult that must have been? He had to not only stab her, she's dead of course, he has to break her chest. He takes the heart out. Now we're in the realm of ritual. He wraps the heart in newspaper, presumably making it more vampiristic. The wrapping of Mabel Lation's heart in newspaper would take on a greater significance as the investigation progressed. Hardman had been her newspaper boy, and perhaps he intended it to be a symbol of revenge and loathing towards an elderly woman against whom he held a grudge. It takes a considerable degree of force to cut through the sternum like that. I mean, surgically, for example, it's done with a saw, you know, a power saw. So it would take quite a bit of force to cut through the sternum. And I wasn't sure what particular type of knife could be used for that. A very sharp kitchen knife would probably do it, and clearly it probably was in this case. The removal of the heart puzzled investigators. Whilst it may have had overtones of the occult, the real reason may have been more practical and all the more chilling for it. To have someone mutilated after death is not common. But in this case, was the action deliberately to kill someone and remove the heart and drain their blood? I, I wouldn't be able to answer that, but it probably was. And I think when the neck has been opened up and the back of the legs, the calves, to try and drain blood, and when not enough blood has appeared for whatever reason, then the assailant has decided to remove the heart in order to obtain more blood. And I think the heart's been removed. The apex of the heart, which is the tip of the heart, being sliced off. So the blood of the heart has been drained and I think the heart's probably been taken out by the hand with a knife, partly pulled, and the tip sliced off and then squozen into that pan to fill that pan with, with blood. With the discovery of this horrific new detail, investigators were at a loss to identify who could have been responsible for such a heinous crime. If I was faced with this case of a 90-year-old woman being stabbed 22, 22 times, I would not have been looking for a fantasist who's into vampires. I would have probably thought more of either robbery or of some sexual behaviour. 17-year-olds don't normally kill old people. They're more likely to kill somebody of their own age, and it's likely to be an impulsive fight, or it's going to be a sexual base, that kind of stuff. To kill somebody because you want their blood is extremely rare. For a 17-year-old, it's, it's, it's unheard of, basically. So he's unusual, to say the least, and that made it difficult for the police because they didn't know originally that they were looking for somebody who was into vampires and fantasies. During the days and weeks following the murder, detectives found themselves with a multitude of leads to follow, all of which reached a dead end. With every day that passed, the killer remained at large, and the chances of justice for Mabel Lation grew less and less. My heart literally bleeds for Mabel Lation, and her heart bled too. In the winter of 2001, the Isle of Anglesey, off the north coast of Wales, was coming to terms with one of the most horrific murders in British criminal history. A self-styled vampire was at large, and no one, including the police, had any idea that this monster was a 17-year-old schoolboy. Matthew Hardman was, to all extents and purposes, a very quiet, 
ordinary, pleasant young man, 17 year old, going to art school. There was nothing at all about Matthew that would have upset anyone. He almost looked like the perfect teenager. He did nothing wrong. He was, in every respect, ordinary, except for the fact that he was convinced in his own mind, for reasons that we can speculate about, that he wanted to be a vampire. Now, not everyone gets out of bed every morning thinking, I'd really like to be a vampire. In fact, very few people do, but he did. And what's extraordinary about Matthew Hartman is that he decided to live it out. And he decided that the only thing he could do was to kill an elderly woman. Mabel Lation was murdered in a frenzied knife attack. Multiple wounds were inflicted on her body. Her corpse was then desecrated as her assailant drained her blood and removed her heart. Investigators were left in little doubt that they were dealing with a killer with a warped mind, a mind unlike any other they had ever encountered. There was a pan, an ordinary cooking utensil type pan, sitting in there which also had blood in it and blood spatter as if blood had been dropped into this pan from a, a low level uh, and within the pan was this object wrapped in newspaper now clearly when we unwrapped all the newspaper that was the heart and the heart had been fairly roughly removed would you need medical knowledge to remove someone's heart and that became a big issue in um, their initial search for a suspect. But it's really down to whether or not one thinks you need medical knowledge to remove someone's heart. And I suppose you could say you needed a certain amount, but is that not available on the internet? That was the difficulty. We didn't understand what the significance of the saucepan was. So her legs had been mutilated and it would appear from close examination of the scene that actually the blood had been taken from the legs into the saucepan. But then I had to make the decision, were we going to have the saucepan fingerprinted, DNA'd, or both, or what, in danger of losing one or the other. So a close, careful examination was undertaken by the Forensic Science Service, and in fact, a human lip mark was found on the saucepan. So it became apparent that whoever was responsible had most probably um, drunk the, the blood of the deceased. The closer investigators examined the crime, the more they focused on its occult overtones. The hope being that this focus would help unmask the killer. There was something uh, ritualistic in the laying out of these items um, and then also the mutilation of Mabel Lation's body. Um, so I think certainly that was initially the angle that the police were heading down in the investigation. The police on the tiny Isle of Anglesey were totally unused to this kind of dreadful crime. It was unimaginable. The devil had come to Anglesey. Suddenly, the population started locking their doors and their windows for fear that something dreadful would happen to them as well, because they could not imagine who could have been responsible. Neither could the police. For several weeks, everyone was both terrified and mystified. The investigation had ground to a halt. 
the police then decided to turn to the local community for help and release some of the more horrendous details of the murder, which had, until then, been withheld from the public. I'm a great believer in uh, involving the community. There's certain things you have to hold back because when you come to interview an offender, there are only certain things the offender would know about the scene, about what had taken place there, which would be further evidence or proof of their involvement. So it was a matter of trying to pacify the local community that we were active, but at the same time not to put too much fear into them about what exactly had taken place. So it was a decision about how much to tell them. And as the um, progress of the investigation went into the second month, it's then I decided to share the issues about the, the cross, the pokers, and about the human heart having been removed. This was headline news in the local papers, in the Daily Post, and on the major news as well. The police were actively looking for suspects and immediately after Mabel Lation in that following week there were a number of what were called suspicious deaths on the island and I think obviously the police had a heightened awareness so any death that had any slight irregularity to it uh, I was asked to come in and uh, examine. I think one of the detectives said that the devil has come to Anglesey um, I think that's a sign of how absolutely obliterating this, this event was for, for local people. I mean, it, this is a, a beautiful island, lots of people go there for holidays, and yet you've got something which is almost out of a horror film uh, happening to a, an inoffensive old lady. So it caused ripples of shock that just went on for ages. Extraordinary though it may seem, Hardman didn't foam at the mouth or tear his hair out or develop horns. He went home perfectly calm, collected, after having committed what could only be described as unimaginably depraved murder. Much like a horror movie, the residents of Anglesey were locking their doors and peering out of their curtains, as a vampire killer was still on the loose. Five weeks pass. Christmas comes and goes, and still the police have no idea who committed this dreadful crime. Until very slowly, they begin to concentrate on the least likely killer anyone could imagine. An upright, apparently intelligent, quiet, respectable 17-year-old boy called Matthew Hardman, who's had an impeccable school record and is now studying at art college. I believed from the start that the answer lay within a short distance. I didn't think that anybody uh, who, who had attacked Mabel Lation had not had some sort of contact with her before, knew her about her circumstances, knew that she lived alone, and I firmly believed that the person responsible had specifically targeted Mabel Lation for a reason. His choice of victim was interesting. It was somebody he actually knew. He'd been the paper boy for three years when he was 13 to 16. So it was only a couple of years uh, previously he'd been the paper boy. He knew her, he knew her house, and I imagine he knew that he could get into the house quite easily. So again, it's quite cold-blooded what he's done, but it's also lazy. Most killers move a further distance away from their home area to start killing. To kill literally on your doorstep is, is very uh, poor in terms of planning and it increases the risk, of course, of being caught. But this case, he wasn't caught for several months because nobody considered him as a suspect. I did involve two uh, criminal psychologists to give me some information, and we built a profile from there. 
But it became clear to me that we were looking for somebody who had some degree of uh, derangement, mental illness, or something perhaps that had happened in the past that they may have come to the notice of the public or the police for them to have behaved uh, in this way. By now, the police were convinced that they were dealing with a killer whose urges were so extreme that they could not be repressed. With this in mind, they appealed to the public, specifically asking for any information about anyone who had an interest in the occult or vampirism. Following this request, a teenage exchange student came forward with some disturbing information. He asked a 16-year-old girl to bite him on the neck because he was convinced, based on no logic or any sensible ideas, that she was a vampire. <laughs> She was going to bite him and make him a vampire, and then he could go around in his uh, hometown killing people because he was a vampire. She told us that he had talked about vampirism and talked about if you were a vampire, that Clanvire PG would be an ideal place to be because there were a lot of elderly living there and there would be a lot of sources of blood. She gave us the name of Matthew Harden. Now, we could have taken that uh, with a pinch of salt, that it wasn't actually um, something that we would act upon, but I thought if somebody's acting that strangely, then we should consider at least tracing them, interviewing them, and then eliminating them from our inquiry. He was 17 years old at the time. He was a paper boy trying to earn a bit of pocket money. To everybody that knew him, his school teachers, his friends, he was the boy next door. At school, he was very clever. He, he played music. He, he was dyslexic. His teachers said he tried very, very hard. He, he was a good reader. He, his friends saw nothing unusual about him. There was nothing gothic about his everyday life. So when Hardman knocked on your door with a paper, you would think, what a nice young lad. We uh, kept him under surveillance for a time, found out that he was studying at the local college and that he was living at home with his mother. So we decided that we would do a full search of the premises. We would arrest Matthew at his home address at, an early, uh, at the early hours of the morning and that we would do a full crime scene examination. Warrant in hand, the police searched Hardman's bedroom, looking for anything that may link him to the murder of Mabel Lation. In amongst his property in his bedroom was a knife which subsequently contained blood from uh, Mabel Lation and we were contacted during the investigation by the Forensic Science Service at the scene at the back of the premises where the broken glass was found by the um, lady delivering the hot food. That was a scene to be the, pre uh, the exit from the premises and that the offender had in fact left blood staining on the windowsill of Mabel Lation. But more interestingly, within the blood staining was also DNA and that was Matthew Harmon's DNA left at the premises. So we had also put him inside the premises, as well as Mabel Lation at his premises. In his bedroom, they discover what could only be described as an extraordinary collection of vampire memorabilia. There are magazines, books. His internet connection is bookmarked with vampire sites. This superficially respectable young man is actually obsessed with being a vampire. Without any doubt, when the police eventually consider him a suspect and they go to his house, they find material there far in excess of what the ordinary teenager would have. The teenager would have a few photographs, a few pictures, uh, maybe not magazine, but they wouldn't have it 
to the extent that he had the intensity of his interest. And that's the key thing. It was this intensity, this belief that went beyond reality about vampires. Quite frightening, quite worrying, because there was very little anybody would have known about it or been able to predict it. This guy, you would not predict, would have killed. The existence of the kind of material that we know Matthew Hardman um, collected and, and devoured um, on the occult uh, will have played a role in what he went on to do, but it won't have. A, the reason it was allowed to shape his behaviour, the reason it, it, it was allowed to have this impact on him was because of a pre-existing psychological dysfunction within him, which was this inability to see other people as fully human. Normally, uh, a healthy person would have other people. Uh, in the narrative of Matthew Hardman, I don't think that there are any parts written for other people. Other people just don't figure, don't exist in his personal narrative. And I think that's exactly what we've seen here with the, the cutting out of the heart and so forth. It, it, he has been allowed, he, he sees other people uh, as without any humanity whatsoever. Um, and when he came across uh, the occult, when he started becoming interested in the occult, that simply channeled what was this profound psychological dysfunction that already existed, although people probably didn't know it was there. The occult simply uh, channeled that dysfunction into this type of horrific offending. It was only when Hardman reached court that the full details of his genesis as a vampire killer came to light and the details were to horrify the world. The so-called vampire of Anglesey was now in police custody, but the mystery surrounding Hardman's motives persisted. The accumulation of forensic evidence, including a footprint found in Mabel's bungalow, the blood on the knife, and finally, the evidence of the German girl whom he tried to persuade to bite him, to turn him into a vampire, persuaded the Crown Prosecution Service to proceed against him. He went to trial at Mould Crown Court. Hardman, pleaded not guilty. He was extremely convincing and extremely dangerous. When um, a boy commits a serious crime, you obviously look for motives. There was no motive whatsoever in this crime, except for the occult. It wasn't sexual, it wasn't gang related, it wasn't drugs. It was a young boy who all on his own it's the most horrible crime imaginable on a totally innocent old lady. You ask yourself why? And the only reason why is an insane reason. He thought he'd be a vampire and live forever. And I'm convinced he thought when it went to court, he would just get not guilty and he'd walk out laughing. He was quiet each day of the trial. I think the trial went on for a couple of weeks. It was held split between Mould and Chester. Uh, but when it came to the sentencing and the jury retired and returned, and then did he only, uh, only then did he really show any emotion and that was a, a tearful response to the finding of guilt. It took them less than four hours to convict him. And the judge's comments after the conviction echo, resonate in my mind. Mr. Justice Richards said, it was a vicious and sustained attack 
on a vulnerable old lady in her own home, aggravated by the mutilation of her body. I am drawn to the conclusion that vampirism had indeed become an obsession with you. That you really did believe the myth that you would achieve immortality by drinking another person's blood. And you found this an irresistible attraction. Given the awful nature of Hardman's crime, it is interesting that he received a sentence which only required him to serve a minimum of 12 years in jail. A lot of psychiatric nurses that have been interviewed by the police asking did they have any knowledge of um, any clients from the North Wales area or who spent time in North Wales who was interested in vampirism, Satanism, because the horrific nature of the crime and the um, associations with black magic, Satanism, vampirism, whatever you want to call it, all led the police to assume it was somebody interested or involved in some kind of witchcraft or Satanism. I had heard this before I um, met Matthew Harmon, and when I was told the man, the lad had been arrested, was being brought into old course. I was waiting to interview him and uh, of all the interviews I've had and I interviewed literally tens of thousands of inmates coming into prisons, he sticks in my mind. I remember him vividly. Matthew Hardman walked into the little room which I had as my office, stood there with a very pleasant grin on his face. Young, handsome, good looking lad, blonde hair, blue eyes, bit of acne. Um, very well spoken, asked me if I was the doctor, explained I was a psychiatric nurse. Sat down, very pleasant, very easy to talk to. And I said, how do you feel? And he said, uh, this is the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me, which I was absolutely flabbergasted when he said that. But you learn to keep a straight face in the business that I was doing in those days. We sat and chatted, chatted for about an hour. He uh, seemed totally unaware and unconcerned about um, the situation he was in. She says, all is a huge joke. It was absolutely exceptional. I've never seen behavior like that before or since. When a person comes into prison, particularly for the first time, there are certain behaviour patterns they exhibit. Sometimes they put on the tough defiance act, I couldn't care less, I couldn't care less, give me life, so what? I can take it. Others are pleading, begging, some are in floods of tears, I want a solicitor, I want me mom, I want to see a doctor, whatever. But his attitude of indifference, granted if he'd been in for shoplifting or smashing a window, and people do go to jail for shoplifting or smashing windows, but he knew what he was accused of, most heinous crime imaginable. Uh, when I was 17, I was a big strapping lad, but if I'd have been taken into prison charged with murder, I would have, would have been in floods of tears. He was just, seemed to think it was all a huge joke. When he was taken to prison, he actually enjoyed the whole process of becoming into prison, and it was the best uh, experience he'd had in his life. Now that's very strange, because you've got a 17 year old boy who had been crying and weeping at his trial when he was sent down for, well, a life sentence. He was sent down for a minimum of 12 years. And yet, within days, he's saying how much he enjoys prison. Does prison actually give him the safety and security that he didn't feel he had at home? We know he had a, 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 a mother. We know he had a stepfather. We know that his uh, biological father died when he was young but he had a nice, stable home background, and yet he's looking for something else. It makes him a very hard character to read and, and understand. I mean, he, he's committed this appalling crime. Uh, he's burst into tears, and then he ends up in prison, and he's, he's quite happy and, and almost enjoying the moment. It could be that he's, he's committed something so grotesque and, and aw 
enormous that he, he, he almost can't tell the difference between reality and, and, and what he has actually done. Um, he, he, he finds it very difficult, having committed this crime, to actually be able to tell the difference between his fantasy and reality. And uh, he's just basically coasting along on this kind of air of delusion. Anglesey has a lot of elderly people in that particular area. And he somehow felt, well, he he'd obviously knew his victim. She knew him. She was easy prey. She was defenceless. But the other thing that went through his scheming little mind was the fact that he believed that nobody would miss her. And Hardman got it into his dysfunctional mind at the time that if he killed her or any old lady, she'd never be missed. Whilst awaiting trial, Matthew Hardman was held on remand, but not in jail, in the prison hospital. Somewhat surprisingly, the reasons for this had nothing to do with any concerns about his mental state. He was admitted to the um, hospital wing, not because he was judged to be ill, but because he was 17 years old in a prison that was only supposed to cope with 18 year olds and over. And um, he spent nearly a year on the hospital wing. I spoke to him once, twice, sometimes three times a week. He never ever um, admitted responsibility for the crime. And he maintained this air of absolute, total indifference. He just seemed to think it was all a huge joke. Whenever I spoke to him, he would say, it's a mistake. That's all he ever said. The day he was convicted, he got uh, 12 years. The judge did comments. He was convicted on overwhelming evidence. That was the expression the judge used. And um, I walked into his cell, and he was curled up in a fetal position, crying. And I said to him, you'll be getting shipped from here, Matthew. All I can say is the only advice I can give you is keep your head down and behave yourself, because um, you're an infamous criminal, you're going to be well known in the young prisoner um, institution that you go to. And he asked me, do you think I'm guilty? And I said, yes I do. I said, I, I said to him, everybody thinks you're guilty. I said, I think you are guilty. I said, I know you're guilty. And he just burst into tears and curled up in tears again. That was the only time I ever saw him display any emotion ever. I referred him to a psychiatrist as a matter of urgency. He was seen by a psychiatrist and he is still in the normal prison system now. I would have said uh, someone like that needed transfer to a high security mental hospital. However, he's still in the prison system. To this day, the case of Matthew Hardman remains unique in the lexicon of British crime. And it's a case whose capacity to shock and disturb remains utterly undiminished. I think my lasting memories of the case will be attending the crime scene and the, uh, the visual record I have of Mabel Lation lying purposely laid out in the position she was on, found in that armchair. Still difficult to believe how anybody could be um, influenced in that way to carry out such a macabre, such a savage, such a brutal beating. Um, a, a, of a, a vulnerable LD old lady within his own community. He only lived a very short distance from her, so I do find it um, difficult to believe why. If we try to understand where Hardman was coming from, I, I think the best term as I can use is he was living in a fantasy world. He was living in a world where lead balls bounce, elephants fly and fairies reign supreme. The thing that really sticks in my mind is when he walked through the door and stood there and smiled at me. He was a young, handsome, well-spoken lad. And if, I haven't got any daughters, but if my daughter had brought him home and said, Dad, this is Matthew I've just met, I would have thought, oh well, what a nice lad. And that was someone who had disemboweled an old lady and drunk her blood. Hardman may never be released, but what is not in doubt is the people of Anglesey will never forget his legacy. The young man who convinced them all that the devil had indeed come to the island. Join me, 
Geoffrey Wansell next time for more Murders by the Sea. Thank you.